1975. Accusations were emerging that Lynch had improperly used his position to profit from land dealings. Before I went to the Governor General to recommend an election on that occasion, I was coming back with, with Philip on a VIP plane. He knew I was leaving the plane to go to Government House. He was preoccupied. And he knew then that the issue was going to break, his personal issue. I was allowed to go out to Government House in total ignorance of that fact. As the crisis deepened, Philip Lynch was admitted to hospital with a serious illness. Is your government having now... an effect on your party's image in the electorate, Prime Minister? Is your government Look. now on the defensive as the Labour government was in 1975? Oh, good heavens, Prime Minister. Good heavens, Minister. Minister, I repeat that question. Do you feel that these reports have damaged your party's standing in the electorate at this time? No. Do you still have faith in this? If there are no questions on any other subject, we started off in Melbourne, fighting our way through a rugby scrum of, uh, of reporters and television cameras, flew to Sydney for a function at the Hilton Hotel, and there was another rugby scrum demanding answers about Philip Lynch, who was sick in hospital. We would have lost that election, and uh, there was only one way to handle that situation, that was for Philip Lynch to go, and he was too ill in hospital to reach a rational decision himself. And the decision was made for him by his colleagues uh, at a meeting that evening in the Commonwealth offices in Martin Place. Why did Mr Lynch have to resign? He believed it best and said so in his letter to me that uh, otherwise the election he felt would be fought on the circumstances of his own affairs. And he wanted the election to be fought on the issue the vital, important economic issues that are before the people of Australia. And uh, I believe that he was right. Malcolm Fraser never visited Philip Lynch in hospital during the whole of that uh, crisis. <coughs> I thought to uh, do that to a man in his sickbed, I thought that was unforgivable. Absolutely unforgivable. Sort of thing you wouldn't do in the lower deck. Maybe you do it uh, at the Grazier's Club. But you don't do it amongst real people. Never. Never. And I, I thought that after that, the uh, Fraser government was shot. They never realised it. But I thought the Fraser government killed itself uh, after two years. <clears throat> because what it showed was that um, hard work and loyalty counted for nothing. Not a thing if it was to save somebody else's hide. There are two kinds of loyalty, unfortunately, and the Prime Minister or the head of a government has to be the arbiter between those two kinds of loyalty. Loyalty to colleagues, loyalty to a person, and that's very important. But there's also the question of loyalty to values, loyalty to a code of behaviour. Lynch would later be exonerated. The big beneficiary was a junior minister, John Howard, elevated by Fraser straight to the Treasury. I hope uh, one of the elements in it was ability, but I wouldn't claim uh, that it was all due to that. I think there is an element of, uh, um, you know, uh, fortuitous circumstances in it as well. He's halved inflation. Well, he's kept his word. And cut taxation. Well, that's helped us. We've halved inflation. Now we're ready to go with $6,000 million worth of development. Malcolm Fraser was returned to government with his huge majority almost intact. For several hours now, thousands upon thousands of people have been lining the streets of Melbourne to pay their last silent tribute to a giant of Australian politics and public life. And as they leave the steps and head across Russell Street in Melbourne, the pallbearers beside them. Parliamentarians, relatives, friends to the late Sir Robert Menzies. The founder of the Liberal Party and symbol of simpler and stable times was finally gone. By August of 1978, Menzies' successors were again enveloped in crisis. 
once again, it involved one of Malcolm Fraser's closest and trusted allies from the 1975 crisis. Uh, I accept without reservation that the Prime Minister has the right to hire and fire. Uh, Senator Reg Withers had been investigated by a Royal Commission for attempting to change the name of an electorate. Withers refused to resign and was sacked by Fraser. Well, it certainly wasn't smart to dump Withers. That was just a ludicrous and appalling thing to do. I mean, it outraged me, and the way in which it was done was divisive. I mean, I'm, I'm trying not to be bring up too many bad things here, but I mean, you know, most of the cabinet met uh, at Kirribilli and discussed that, and then uh, I think uh, Margaret Guilfoyle, Jim Killen, and I came up the next day unaware that they'd had a sort of an informal cabinet discussion the night before, and we were handed the report and told to endorse the sacking of Withers. Well, I recall being so outraged, I threw the report away, it hit an orange juice jug and smashed everywhere. I mean, it was hardly edifying conduct, but I was outraged at this, and I asked for a break and a call-off so we could re actually read the report that was given to us before we could discuss it. So we had uh, a break for, I don't know, say an hour, and I read this report and became even more convinced that Withers should not be going. I know that uh, all Senator Withers' colleagues who were discussing these matters yesterday felt a, a very real sense of regret and of sadness at uh, what had happened and in a sense maybe at what had to happen. But uh, unanimously ministers felt that there was no other decision that could be reached. I mean, what had Withers done? Come on. I mean, he'd picked up a telephone and told the commissioner they shouldn't call the seat of the Gold Coast Gold Coast, it should be called McPherson. And he was to be sacked for this? His entire record of public service was to be dispensed with on the trash can because he'd suggested the change in a name? I mean, well, this was just ludicrous. I mean, sometimes Malcolm became... had such a fetish with being seen to be doing something proper. It didn't matter that he acted improperly to achieve what he thought was proper. After I was sacked, they said, uh, uh, how do you feel about it? And I said, well, you know, I most certainly should never have come into Parliament because I spent uh, four years of my life in the Navy. And all the time I was at sea, I was never, never, never frightened, really. Oh, I was a bit scared when you think you're going to get your head off. But you're really not that frightened because I always knew that if some disaster struck, the captain would save me before he'd save himself. And he would go down with his ship, the last, but he'd make certain I was saved. I said, whereas in politics, what happens is, the captain's the first day of the side and takes all the life belts. It's very easy not to have any concern about failures. You stick with your mates no matter what they do. Um, I'm just not made that way, I'm afraid. Country Party coalition has been returned, but with the majority sharply reduced. As the Liberals won their third straight election, new economic ideas were taking root on the other side of the world. But the main thing is that I think that we do keep links between heads of government. Fraser had been seen as a soulmate of Margaret Thatcher, but he was uncomfortable with the free market ideology emerging from Thatcher's Britain. Australia is a long way away in, in terms of miles from some of these events. One person in the Fraser Ministry was becoming attracted by these ideas. The Treasurer, John Howard. After the 1980 election was the beginning of my differences with Malcolm. My, my biggest disappointment was his backing away from the introduction of a broad-based indirect tax. In the 1980 election campaign, I had an understanding with him and Doug Anthony that uh, none of us would rule out the introduction of a broad-based indirect tax if we were re-elected. Because I knew and many people knew that that reform was necessary. John Howard had been influenced by his economic advisor at the time, Dr John Hewson. When the people of Australia have so emphatically turned their backs on a broad-based tax as they did in March of 1993. I'm not sure why John Howard uh, wants to show a great deal of interest in uh, being able to pursue it 
10 years earlier or 11 or 12 years earlier. Um, it was clearly very bad politics. Uh, the, the political dynamics of the time were very simply that uh, the Liberal Party had a quite uh, unprecedented mandate from the people to go down a reformist, uh, economic rationalist path. If the charge is that we did not perform the way economic rationalists in the 1980s claimed they wanted to perform, then I'll plead very, very guilty to that. I wouldn't want to do what economic rationalists wanted to do because I think their, uh, their views were extreme. It was an accountant's view and very often a false view and a very cruel view. Malcolm Fraser and John Howard began to take opposing sides in economic debate. Malcolm Fraser at heart was a regulator. He didn't trust or like banks very much. Uh, he has all his political career been an avowed opponent of um, floating exchange rates. Australian banking is in a state of upheaval. With the growth of building societies, credit unions and cash management trusts, banks are being forced to compete for their customers. In 1980, Malcolm Fraser's office ordered an inquiry into Australia's highly regulated financial system. Fraser and Howard now accuse each other of delaying the process of reform in the setting up of the Campbell inquiry on banking and exchange rates. The fact that there would be a capital market inquiry was forced through the Monetary Policy Committee of Cabinet. And the Monetary Policy Committee of Cabinet asked for the Treasurer to give us terms of reference within six weeks. We got them about nine months later. The important thing, of course, was the response when the report came down. And uh, <laughs> not much doubt as to who dragged their heels then. Cabinet did finally approve the introduction of some foreign banks. But other reforms, such as the floating of the dollar, would have to wait for the Labor government. John Howard is adamant he did take at least one other submission to Cabinet. I tried from November 81 <clears throat> until the defeat of the government to have some other things implemented, including a substantial deregulation of interest rates, and he was opposed to that. No submission of any significance in relation to that report was rejected or delayed by my cabinet. There are at least, there's at least one and I think two letters on record saying why is it taking so long to have submissions written? Why aren't you getting submissions up? The submissions never arrived by the time we had an election. The economic debate in the Liberal Party began to intersect with leadership tensions. Some who despaired of Fraser's policies even began toying with the idea of Andrew Peacock as an alternative leader. In April 1981, Andrew Peacock resigned from Fraser's cabinet. He has bypassed the system of government by acting with a manic determination to get his own way, and I find the constant dis disloyalty and erratic acts of behaviour intolerable and not to be endured. Andrew's resignation did significant damage to the government. If you look at the polls at that point, we dipped down in the polls. And if it hadn't been for that resignation, the 1983 election might have been quite different. I wish the whole thing hadn't occurred. Because I'll be very frank with you, I don't think I should have resigned from Malcolm Fraser's cabinet. I certainly wasn't interested in challenging Malcolm Fraser at that period. I became interested later on. One of the reasons, ironically, I became interested in is that I kept hearing that I was the likely one. Later that year, a new car plan was introduced by the Liberals' deputy leader, Philip Lynch. The economic reformers in the party were dismayed. It didn't go nearly far enough in reducing tariffs. A group of backbenchers led by John Hyde came close to overturning Cabinet. It was the final blow for Lynch. Well, I believe it's time for a, a younger man to assume the office. At the same time, Malcolm Fraser called on a challenge against the looming Andrew Peacock. The purpose of Thursday's meeting must be to face the issue and end the speculation once and for all.
I felt that, uh, in fact, Malcolm Fraser was becoming far too authoritarian, that, in fact, the structures he'd put in place were setting minister against minister and public servant against public servant. The structure was wrong, and he was behaving wrongly. Peacock lost the challenge. That vote is over now, and as I indicated, uh, both privately to the Prime Minister and semi-privately, in the sense that it was in the party room, uh, that we have to work together, and he has my support. At the same party meeting, the reform-minded John Howard would take the deputy leadership. At the time, I thought the selection of John Howard as deputy leader was a reasonable choice. I had clearly promoted John Howard into a number of positions, including into the acting treasury portfolio after an election had begun in very difficult circumstances. And he handled those issues with great competence and a considerable degree of skill. And he's a good parliamentary debater. Uh, but um, I didn't realise, perhaps, uh, that there were some other implications of the change. And if I had, for the good of the party, I think it would have been better if Philip Lynch had stayed. The implications of the change were that the leader and his deputy were heading in different directions. Mr Howard went through the annual ritual of addressing the National Press Club on the budget, but today his speech was interrupted briefly by a group of so unemployed who entered the club by a side door waving placards. Malcolm Fraser's instincts were to spend money to ease the burden of recession. He imposed this strategy on a reluctant Howard. I felt that having told the community for six years that the way to salvation was through restraint and not trying to spend your way out of trouble, it was a bit disingenuous to then say that the way to salvation is to spend your way out of trouble. Now, if a treasurer feels so put out by a particular budget that he believes he's got no part in it, then presumably he should have taken some sort of action, and if he didn't, that says something about him. Sometimes the most courageous thing to do, particularly if, for example, you're a deputy leader, is, uh, is to stay in, uh, knowing full well that if it all falls apart, you'll get the blame. And that turned out, in a sense, to be my fate. If you do not move immediately, you will be arrested. Is there any reason why you cannot move? Uh, yes. You're under arrest. Franklin and Gordon Rivers support the only large limestone ecology in the South West. We By 1982, events throughout the country were beginning to slip beyond Malcolm Fraser's control. These men are collecting their last pay packets. These men, along with thousands across the country, have been laid off. The economy was staggering from recession and drought. Unrest reached the parliament itself when retrenched coal miners confronted the government. Economic problems have been severe, they've been great, and uh, we ourselves uh, uh, might hold some of the responsibility for this uh, because I think we were too optimistic about what we or the economy working in partnership could perform. The strain uh, was telling on Malcolm Fraser. The country is in reducing plans for an early election in 1982 were thwarted when the Prime Minister was admitted to hospital with serious back problems. Fraser recovered and early the following year he called a snap election, hoping to go to the polls against Bill Hayden. The Prime Minister moved early here in Canberra today to bring on the early election. I recommended to His Excellency that there should be a double dissolution of the Parliament. In a day of drama, as the Prime Minister was at Government House, the Labour Party was replacing Hayden with Bob Hawke. I repeat, it gives me no joy to have to do this. I'm sure you'd understand. It's created a great deal of heartburn for me. Bill Hayden has done a remarkably courageous thing. Malcolm Fraser went into the campaign without the opportunity to test Hawke as opposition leader in the Parliament. decision that really I want to spend much time defending because I'd, since you lost the election or I lost the election it, the timing was clearly wrong you're not going to call an early election if you think you're going to lose I can remember in the final days of the Fraser period 
I think we'd come in on a VIP flight to, to Richmond. I can remember saying uh, to, uh, to others in the car, look, you know, I never want anything more to do with this business as long as I live. I was disappointed. Uh, I thought uh, opportunities had been missed. I thought, uh, you know, politics was, uh, was winning out in a sense, I suppose. But, you know, we'd made a lot of changes in some areas, but really, compared to what was needed to be done, we'd fallen well short. I wanted to wash my hands of the whole process. By halfway through the campaign, and certainly with 10 days to go, it was pretty evident that we weren't going to win. The polling was showing that, and, and I had a number of talks with him. Now, he said to me, Tony, whatever this shows, I'm going to fight this election up to the line, and you will not notice in me any change in my demeanour in fighting this campaign up until polling day. To give more power to union leaders of this calibre. And he stuck to his word. He campaigned as though he didn't have a, a problem in terms of winning the election, although he knew, and so consequently, he had given a lot of thought to his future. First, I'd like to congratulate Mr. Hawke and the Australian Labour Party on winning this election. I want to say that I, from this moment, resign from the leadership of the Liberal Party. I will not contest the leadership of the Liberal Party. I don't think Fraser should have resigned after the 1983 defeat. Malcolm should have stayed uh, as a caretaker leader of the opposition for a year or two. That would have given the Liberal Party an opportunity of settling down and thinking a bit harder about uh, the medium and the longer term. Uh, I, I certainly would have appreciated him staying because inevitably uh, uh, all the rubbish that was hurled at the former government that always gets hurled at just defeated governments, uh, all of it came in my direction. Nobody else was particularly keen to join me. <laughs> Whether I stayed on as caretaker leader or not, it would have been better for the party if I had stayed. It really would have. Even if I'd stepped aside from events for two or three years, by the time 1987 had come around and people had demonstrated, or, or that Howard and Peacock had demonstrated that they weren't prepared to work with each other, then what would they have done? I think if Malcolm had stayed on in the parliament, as time went by, I think he would have found himself back again as leader. And I think that our period in the wilderness would have been a lot shorter. In his final days, Malcolm Fraser handed the party over to Andrew Peacock and John Howard. And for a man who'd been Prime Minister for more than seven years, there seemed to be few regrets at his departure. Why did the party reject Fraserism? Well, I, Malcolm had been a huge figure, a towering figure, who cast such a huge shadow, and I suppose uh, uh, people wanted to get out from under the shadow. It created an opportunity for those people concerned with uh, a reformist agenda to get on with the job and in order to do that effectively one I think had to point to Malcolm Fraser as having been an impediment to that reform process uh, uh, during his period as Prime Minister. I really believe that uh, the experience after the Fraser government where he was, in effect, demonised. It's been a very unhappy thing for the Liberal Party. Uh, we've got to do better uh, about cherishing our past. As time passed, the differing verdicts on the Fraser government came to be publicly expressed by Fraser himself and his deputy. It was a rift over the way the Liberal Party views its own history. Now, Fraser was very generous to me. He promoted me. He lifted me out of the ruck, and I'm publicly very grateful for that. And I returned that by giving, giving him enormous loyalty uh, in the time that I was a member of his government. Naturally, after Fraser went, I had a perfect entitlement to uh, put my own view of the world, and I had a perfect entitlement to acknowledge the areas where we disagreed. I mean, the proposition that... I should have spent the years after 1983 uh, defending everything that uh, Malcolm did it was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, I find that uh, almost offensive. 
I can remember issuing a statement about 1971 or maybe early 1972 criticizing those liberals who were trying to disassociate themselves from the legacy of the Menzies years. And I was making a simple point that if you depreciate, you, you, you cut off the legs of the party uh, through those years, then what does the party stand for? But I suppose the point is that if there were people in the early 70s who were going to do that with Benzies, who retired in his own time in 1966, a great party hero, they were certainly going to do it to Fraser, who uh, had won three elections and then lost one. And sure enough, they did. And I would like to thank all my colleagues and the Liberal Party right around the country for the support they've given for the last seven years. Mr. Hawke has just arrived. He's pushing his way through the crowds at the moment. Looking very pleased. There really has been magnificent support in very difficult times. There are many wonderful people who believed in what the government was doing. And I thank them for that. at 7.30, the information superhighway that's already at your front door. We're after faces if there's anyone there. Ah, thank you. It's like a phone call, only a lot, lot cheaper. The weather is beautiful. That's next, 7.30. Hello again, Clive Kale, updating ABC National News. Just minutes ago, leaders from Jordan and Israel signed an historic peace treaty. The agreement ending 46 years of conflict was officially endorsed by King Hussein of Jordan, the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, and US President Clinton. An official ceremony is still underway on the Israeli-Jordanian border. Paul Keating claims Australia has broken the back of inflation. Figures from the September quarter showed a 0.6% downturn. Inflation had been on the rise for the previous two quarters. The annual rate is now 1.9%. Australia will have a new plastic $20 note on Monday. The note features two outstanding Australians, Mary Riby, a child convict who became a successful businesswoman, and John Flynn, who founded the Royal Flying Doctor Service. Full roundup and late edition at 20 past 10 tonight. As